Welcome back everyone to another Max Tech Tech. Today we have another custom build with Belladros Wither Bloom. I refer to it as Bug Bomb. Uh, we're going to focus on creating and sacrificing small token creatures to generate big value, treating life like the resource we all know it to be. Before we take a deep dive into the deck, if custom decks and upgrade guides are your jam, please consider subscribing. Helps the channel to grow, and you know, ex expands my reach into the uh, the YouTube network. All right, let's get into this deck. We'll start off with our token makers, and right off the bat, we have our commander, Belladros Witherbloom. At every upkeep, he's going to generate us a lovely little one-one pest. When those pests die, they're going to gain us a little bit of life. So, early on, he's going to generate you four every round, and obviously as the game goes on, that number will get a little bit smaller until it's down to just two. Callous Blood Mage can make a pest or let us draw cards on ETB. Can also exile a graveyard, but generally, in my pot at least, you know, it's not something we're overly concerned about. We don't have a whole lot of graveyard recursion happening. Uh, but I like the flexibility of the Callous Blood Mage. Following up the Blood Mage, we have the Sedgemore Witch, which rewards us for casting our Incense and Sorceries in the form of a Pest. They're also just like a nice kind of early drop, right? A 3-2 with Menace with Ward 3 pay, uh, ward pay 3 life. Phenomenal. A nice way to kind of get like a little bit of cheeky damage in. And also, you know, generate some Pests for just doing what we're doing already. Following that up, we have Valentin, Dean of the Vein. Another menacey creature with a little bit of lifelink, so we're going to gain our life, we're going to chip in a little bit of early damage. And if a non-token creature in opponent controls would die, it gets exiled instead. Get that thing out of here. And at that moment, we could pay two and create ourselves a pest, right? We're going to sacrifice those pests for value, so we want to generate as many of them as possible. Speaking of generating as many pests as possible, we have ten the pests, right? We're going to sacrifice a creature, we're going to create a bunch of little pests equal to that creature's power. We're swarming the field. You thought I had one big boy? No, I actually have 25 pests. Maniacal laughter. Now, on occasion we're going to have cards in hand that we just don't really care about, and Pestilence Cauldron lets us discard those cards in order to create a little pest. It also has the added benefit of, once again, being a little bit of a more flexible card, uh, so we could have each opponent mill cards equal to like the amount of life we gained if the game's going long, and we have... Actually, this is, um... Hold on. What's this? A Brain Burst? <laughs> Pestilence Cauldron is actually a win condition for us, and I never realized it. There's an infinite combo in this deck, in the form of the Accomplished Alchemist. Let's actually go over to him real quick. The Accomplished Alchemist, who's a lovely little mana dork that I could tap for, you know, any color, or I could tap to add X of one color, where X is the amount of life that I gained this turn. Right, on its own, a little innocuous, but, you know, whatever, whatever. How do I go infinite with him? With the Staff of Domination, right? If I've gained at least five life, I could tap the Accomplished Alchemist for five mana. Use three of it to untap my lovely alchemist. One of it to untap the Staff of Domination. I have one mana floating. I infinitely gain mana this way. Using that infinite mana, I pay two, tapping the Staff to gain one life, one to untap it, right? But it's okay, we have infinite mana, it doesn't matter. Getting back to the Pestilent Cauldron, tap one, Tap it. Each opponent mills cards equal to the amount of life I gained this turn. I literally mill all of my opponents with Pestle and Cauldron, and it's so innocuous. They're like, oh, it's here for the pest creation, which it was, but it actually does, it goes infinite. It just mills all of my opponents out of nowhere. What a lovely surprise for all of us. <laughs> Let's carry on though, shall we? We have the Awakening Zone. So these are, you know, they're self-sacrificing, which is good for our, for us anyways, but we get to sacrifice these tokens to add 
you know, one colorless mana to our pool. We have a lot of death triggers that happen in the de in the deck. Uh, so this is just like a nice way to get a little bit of ramp and get a little bit of sack fodder going. Up next, we have Black Market Connections. Uh, so life's a resource we're gaining and losing it constantly in this stack, and this lets us create treasure for ramp, draw cards, and create some 3-2 colorless shapeshifters. So we're getting defenders, who we, could wheel, who we could also sack, we're drawing cards, we're ramping. And it's like, 6 life? 6 life, not a big deal, right? We have enough life gain triggers throughout the deck that I think we're going to be okay. Open the graves, so on occasion, you know, some of our non-tokeny boys are going to die. We're not loving it, but it happens. When that does happen, we're going to go ahead and replace them with little 2-2 black zombie token creatures. We also have Skeletal Swarming. So at each of our end steps, we're going to create at least one, but more often than not two, uh, black skeleton creatures that are 1-1s. One and this is going to give each of them a little bit of trample. So, they have to attack every turn, which is fine. But, if they happen to live longer, cool. And if not, it seems like their attack's going to like, kind of be a fizzle for us. We just sack them to something, and we get our death triggers anyways. Lastly, we have Field of the Dead. So... You know, we do need to have at least seven lands with different names out on the field for this to sort of generate a bunch of zombies for us. But, it's definitely a possibility. And, you know, one that, if it pays off, cool, and if not, hey, still a land. Pretty happy with it. With all these token generators, we definitely need some sack outlets to generate value for us in the form of damage and card draw. We're going to start off with Ayara, first of Lockthwain. Uh, so she's she's here doing double double work, right? So whenever she or another black creature enters the battlefield under our, our control, each opponent's going to lose a life, we're going to gain a life. You know, we have a lot of repeated token generators, and aside from the Awakening Zone Eldrazi spawn, all of them are black, right? The pests are black, the skeletons are black. I guess the black market connections, ironically... Not a black creature, right? Just a changeling. But still, we have a lot of black creatures in the deck. We're going to be pinging for a lot of damage, and I can tap her to sacrifice a black creature to draw a card. Fell Stinger, right? A lovely little 3 2 death toucher. When I ETBs, I get to exploit by sacking a creature, probably one of these little tokens. And when I do, I'm going to draw two cards at the cost of two life. And I think that's fine. I'm definitely willing to make that sacrifice. Card draw is important. We're looking to dig for, you know, this infinite combo that we just discovered during the deck tech. Skullport Merchant. Uh, he does actually create a token on ETB in the form of a treasure token. But he's really here to let us sacrifice creatures or a treasure to draw cards. Using him in combination with Black Market Connections actually does allow us to always have, you know, both a creature and a treasure that we could sack. But uh, he's here for he's here for that sack outlet. Deadly brew. Everyone's gonna sack a creature. If we sack the creature this way, we get to grab a permanent, right? Not specifically a creature, but just any permanent from our grave back to our hand. So it's like, oh, I discarded something that I kind of cared about to create a pest using the pestilent cauldron. Cool. I'm getting that back. And I'm probably sacrificing the past that I created by discarding the card in the first place. A little bit of roundabout value, but I'm happy with it. In a similar vein, we have Infernal Offerings. We're going to choose an opponent. We're each going to sack a creature, draw two cards. I'm not thrilled about the fact that I'm giving an opponent two cards, but if someone's really far behind, I don't mind currying favor with them. You know, in the form of letting them draw two cards if they have a creature that they don't really care about losing. Uh, then, in addition to that, we get to choose an opponent. Could be the same, could be different. And we're each going to cheat a creature from our grave back out onto the field. With Pestilent Cauldron, right, we could discard a nice big beefy boy, sack a pass, and then cheat that thing out. Uh, you know, a lot of possibilities. Infernal Offering is good. 
Following that up, we have Plum the Forbidden. This is actually a pretty good response to a board wipe. Not in the sense that we're going to prevent ourselves from being wiped, but in the sense that we're going to draw a bunch of cards from it. So by just casting it, we're going to draw at least one card and lose one life. But we can sacrifice as many creatures as we want, and for each time we do, we get to copy the spell. This actually works really well with a number of things in our deck, including Professor Onyx. Uh, so whenever we cast or copy an instant or sorcery, each opponent's going to lose two life, we're going to gain two life. So this potentially, if we have a big enough board state, could just finish our opponents off, right? If we had 20 creatures, unlikely I know, but, you know, for the, the sake of argument, we have 20 creatures out, everyone's still at full life. You know, we Professor Onyx the field, plumb that forbidden, you know, sack everything, just win. That Sedgemore Witch, which we've already talked about, is going to generate us a bunch of pests for every time we've done this. I'll start looking at timing rules to see if I can then sacrifice those pests. I, I'm going to assume not. Right. Well, it's whatever you cast or copy. Hmm. I'm gonna look into the timing rules, but I'm pretty sure I can't go infinite with that. Though it would be hilarious. And lastly, the Witherbloom Apprentice uh, is gonna gain us a life and have each opponent lose a life for every time we do it as well. So. You know, definitely a lot of possibilities out there in terms of how we're using Plum the Forbidden to really just, like, be a powerhouse. Moving on from that Forbidden spell, we have Village Rites. So we're going to sack a creature, draw two cards, staple in every sacrifice deck. We have a copy of Ashnod's Altar. Kind of wish it was one of the other altars, uh, but I just don't have enough copies of them, and I don't run proxies. Uh, but it's still pretty good, right? Because we're going to sacrifice a creature, we're going to generate two mana. And if we actually happen to use it to sacrifice a pest, which gains us a life on sacrifice, we could use this mana for uh, some shenanigans that we'll get into a little later. Which is Cauldron. For one to black, we could tap it and sack a creature, gain a life, draw a card. And Argle's Bloodfast, once transformed, lets us sacrifice creatures to gain life equal to their toughness. With all this death all around us, you know, we need to have ways of benefiting from more than just the spells and, like, outlets that are letting us do it in the first place. And one of my favorite ways to do this is Poison Tip Archer, because it, effect it triggers off of any creature dying, not just ours. Uh, so every time a creature dies, each opponent will lose one life. We're not gaining any life off of it, but like, again, that ping damage, he can go a long way to dealing a lot of damage. We have Shesara. Shesra? Sesra. <laughs> Sesra, Death's Whisper. Uh, whenever she ETBs, we do get to force a creature to block, which is cool for any of our death touchy kind of things to like remove a creature from the board. Uh, but more importantly, at the end step of a creature died this turn, we get pay two life, and if we do, we get to draw a card. We also have our Zulaport Cutthroat, so anytime another creature I control dies, we're gonna have each opponent lose one life, we're gonna gain one life. And one of the juggernauts, juggernauts of the deck, Moldervine Reclamation. Whenever a creature we control dies, we're gonna gain a life and draw a card. So again, with things like Plum the Forbidden, you know, this would basically cancel out the life gain, life loss, and let us draw, you know, a bunch of cards trying to get to our infinite combo. Now we have a lot of life gain in this deck, and although we could just let our, our life, you know, rise for the fun of it, we may as well look for some life gain triggers, right? So starting us off, the other half of Valentin, Dean of the Vein, is Lyset, Dean of the Root, which is actually my preferred side to play in this deck. Uh, so whenever we gain life, we can pay one. When we do, we get to put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature 
Uh, and those creatures gain Trample. So with our infinite life gain combo we saw earlier, this is actually a great way to, you know, really just beef up our whole board, swing it at everybody. We have Trampley Boys, you know, we're going for this nice Wombo Combo Punch. But how are we gaining all this life, right? We've seen a couple things in like the form of pests and, you know, Mortivine Reclamation, but we have a lot of other life gain like inherently built into the deck. Uh, I'm not going to go over anything that's, you know, just lifelink. We know that those gain us life. Uh, but we also have things like the Swarm Guild Mage. We could pay two, tap it, gain two life. With the Bloom Apprentice, which we've already touched on a little bit. Primal Command, which is going to gain us seven life if we so choose. It has a lot of other options, though, in terms of returning creatures to our library. Uh, having someone shuffle their entire graveyard back into their library and searching for a creature card and adding it to hand. Creature cards like, you know, our accomplished alchemist, who goes infinite. Witherbloom Command, which again is one of those nice versatile spells, so we could either, you know, drain someone for two life, we could do a little graveyard recursion, we could destroy something that's a little small, uh, or we could just make, you know, something our opponent has a little weaker. That way we could swing into it a little bit more comfortably. Nightmare's Thirst uh, gains us a life, right? And based on how much life we've gained, we get to probably destroy a creature, right? We're gaining a lot of life in this deck. So we're hoping that, you know, the amount of life gained on average is around like four or five a turn. I haven't run the numbers, but like, we're gaining life, right? Veraska's Contempt is sort of a non-bow, in the sense that, like, it's exiling a creature or planeswalker instead of, you know, just destroying them. So a lot of our death triggers aren't going to go off, but we are going to gain two life. And for that, it gets to hang out. We have the Cosmos Elixir. So at the beginning of our end step, we're going to draw a card if we have life total higher than our starting. Otherwise, we're gaining two life. In a similar vein, uh, in the sense that it's, you know, it's repeated, it's happening every turn. We have the Fountain of Renewal, which is just going to gain us one life at upkeep. We could also pay three to sack it to draw a card. But it's really here for, like, that first part. If we're in trouble, you know, we could sack it and, like, hope to find an answer. But, uh, that life gain's good for us. We also have the Reaper's Talisman, so it's going to grant Death Touch, which is important for our Death Triggers to happen more frequently. And also, if the creature attacked on its own, the attacked player is going to lose two life and we're going to gain two life automatically. So, more draining is happening. We like to see it. Last one we're going to mention is the Revenge of Ravens. So whenever a creature attacks us or a Planeswalker we control, they're going to lose one life, we're going to gain one life. And this for each creature. So this is actually a great, you know, way to use our life set, right? Every time we're attacked by a single creature, if we have some open mana, we can pay one. Beef up our board, it's a good time. As we know, life is a resource though. We should be spending that life a little bit. Uh, so cards like Sun and Blood do the trick, right? We're gonna pay two life, draw two cards. Bolus's Citadel is actually kind of like the, the key to our life spending here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just cast spells off the top of our library for mana. And we can tap it to sack 10 non-land permanents, and each opponent loses 10 life. Uh, so if we actually have a bunch of, you know, tokens and stuff out, and we're going infinite with our Accomplished Alchemist, this is kind of another way to go ahead and just, you know, sack those boys out, cause people to lose life, untap all the Citadel, you get the gist. Greed does require us to pay a single black and two life, but we do get to draw a card off of it. So again, we're digging for for this infinite combo to try and finish some people off. Phyrexian Arena is going to let us draw an extra card at the cost of a life. And of course, Professor Onyx, who we've already talked about, is going to let us plus one to lose a life. Look at the top three, choose one to add, toss the rest in the grave. Uh, she's also a nice way to force opponents to sacrifice things. This is going to get our death triggers going. And if we manage to get her up to her 8, we're going to force opponents to discard. If they choose to not or they just can't, 
they're going to lose life, and it triggers seven times, so it's potentially 21 damage to each opponent. But alright guys, that's the deck. As always, the full deck list is linked in the description below. What cards do you think I'm missing? Uh, you know, what cards are you kind of questioning being here in the first place? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this content and want to see more of it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you want to interact with uh, the rest of the community, there's a link to our Discord down in the description where we're brewing decks and getting sneak peeks at the deck text to come. And once we have enough people kind of in there on a regular basis, we're going to start playing some Commander over Spell Table. But until next time, guys, good luck with those builds, and have a good one.